what we're here to do is provide better care and that's better care for patients and for the citizen because part of what we need to do is try and take some of the people out of the system in order for us to be able to alleviate some of the pressures that are on the system. We've got to deliver services that not only that the care providers want to use but also that the citizen wants to engage with. Patient engagement, self-care and prevention, this is all about giving access to the patients, their care and to their record. So we've talked about this for years, but now we're starting to make it a reality. This is all about how can we give them trusted information and trusted apps so that they can then provide help, um, care for themselves. Urgent emergency care, we've got to be able to take some of, this, some of the pressure and some of the um, increasing numbers out of the system. And what we found is that people that ring up onto our pathway system, if you put an automated recording on that says, actually, you can log on and you can do this yourself now, we've got over a 10% channel shift in people moving on towards technology. Then we start talking about integrated so uh, um, care and social care. We've got to stop seeing this as two separate issues. We've got to start making it so that standards get adopted and that suppliers work to standards that will enable interoperability between different systems. Because unless these systems are actually built secure by design, they're resilient and they're scalable, then we won't be able to keep the public trust. If, we, if a clinician can save 29 minutes by just looking at a patient summary care record rather than having to go through a load of notes, that's got to be meaningful. It took us round about eight to 10 years to get a really meaningful number of people that are on a summary care record. So now we should be moving to the next stage. We shouldn't wait another 10 years to get to enhanced summary care record. Let's make a system where people can get an enhanced record, but we do it through consent. So we do it where the patient and the clinician have agreed that that's what they want to be stored about them. 11% of 999 calls don't end up with an ambulance being sent. Now, if you think about adding that 11% back in, what would that do in terms of the time that it'll take to actually get the ambulances to where they need to be? That 11% to me needs to be better, but we need to work out where's the risk appetite. E-referrals. We've halved the number of missed appointments. Now, that's a really good thing because if you've got a load of people that don't turn up, you get the fail to attends, then you, you end up with a 50% a reduction in that. Then all of a sudden, you've got 50% more appointments that you can then give out because you're not having to do the reappointments. We've also, if secondary care starts to take up fully e referrals, we'll end up where we'll save over £50 million a year. And then electronic prescriptions. We've got a number of providers that provide both in a prescribing and dispensing um, manner for electronic prescriptions. But you will, you, when you speak to some of the pharmacists that are out there and some of the GPs, they cannot believe just how much time and effort that they save when they look back to what they used to be doing when they had the FB10s. So all of these things are real, but none of them are cutting edge. These are all things that we've had for a while, and we're now starting to get the full adoption and take up. And what I want to drive is we need to get that adoption and take up far faster. So... We do all of this, and why wouldn't you do technology? When I was younger, in the days of the Sweeney, what you used to be able to do is you'd see the guy with a mask on and you knew who the criminals were. These days it's a little bit harder because we've now got the sort of idea of cybercrime. We can't expect we're going to have a security expert in all, in all organisations. We've got so many different providers of care, some of them that are sort of so small, you know, it's the, it's the receptionist that's responsible for IT in their organisation. They're not cyber experts. If you had to write down now the ten things that you've got to do, what would you do in terms of the priority? And so, none of these are rocket science. So when did you rehearse your incident plan? Are people doing what they should be doing? Are they patching? Have you got a paper copy of your incident plan? I got a phone call from somebody and, it, and it, I felt so sorry for them. They put every, they were trying to go paperless. So they put their incident plan on the system that had got the ransomware attack. Does everyone know what your roles and responsibilities are? Because when you get into a crisis, people just tend to either act like headless chickens or go missing. What's your escalation points? So have you got a gold, silver and bronze command? If you need that sort of thing, and you're an organisation that's big enough to do it, do you know the contact details are of your partners? So if you've got suppliers, and a lot of suppliers are in the room, do you have their name contacts so that you can pick the phone up and ring them if you get something like this to make sure that you understand what the impact is on your services? How often are you going to meet face to face? You need to understand things like that. So is it three hours? Is it every hour? Or do you just not need to come back together again for a sort of 12-hour period? Because you need to allow the people that are doing the work to go in and do the work. You don't want to keep bringing them back in again to actually come in and just have a face-to-face -face meeting to say they're doing the work. How do you communicate with staff and the media and other agencies? Do you know National Cyber Security Centre? Do you know what our details are if you're a um, care provider? And patching and cyber hygiene. You make sure that your firewalls, if you get future state firewalls, you make sure they're protected. You make sure you've got resilience built in. 
but you've also got to make sure your AV is up to date. You've got to make sure your operating system's patched. If you get one of those wrong, the others might save you on certain attacks, but it won't save you on all of them. So you've got to make sure that you've got layered protection in place. So National Data Guardian. Don't say this is the guy that sat in the corner on technology. And if you do think it's about them, who's watching the guy in the corner that does technology? Who's watching the watchers? Staff are responsible for data security. We've got to give them the training. If we don't train staff on what they should be doing with information assurance, you can't blame the staff if they don't do it. The process is, don't give people elevated rights forever. If they move job, they probably don't need it. Don't give them access to everything. Just give them access to what they need access to. And then technology. I want to get to a position where we actually, we treat security in the same way we treat safety. So if there's a near miss, we report it, and we encourage people to report it. So if I can leave you with one thing, I would say, don't blame the IG guys and don't blame the ICT guys because everything that I've talked about so far needs leaders in the organisations and it needs suppliers to be able to help support the organisation be able to do more but do it safely. Thank you.